goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities, with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students. People that lack the financial resources or just those who do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12.30 Pacific Standard Time. If you aren't able to attend the event, all of our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end up with a Q&A with the speakers. Any questions that you have, you may put it in the Q&A session on Zoom, and our team members will read them and have them answer. After you have attended our event, you can log on to our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with the upcoming events or just want to tell your pre-med friends about the pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok as at pre-med CC. Hi everyone and welcome. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Fogarty and Dr. Fogarty is an Associate Dean of Admissions and Recruitment um, and Dr. Glenn Fogarty um, oversees all aspects of the college's professional MD and dual degree admission processes. He also guides the implementation of high school and college outreach activities, community school partnerships, as well as the development of a robust recruitment program for diverse and talented students. Dr. Fogarty received his Bachelor of Science in Hospitality Administration from Georgia State University, an MBA while living overseas, and a doctorate in educational leadership and policy studies with a concentration in higher education administration at Arizona State University. Welcome, Dr. Fogarty. Uh, Veronica, thank you. And, and everybody, uh, good evening. I'm going to share my screen. And when I do that, I think I need to flip it really quick. And we'll see how this goes go full screen and veronica make sure i'm doing this correctly display settings is that the correct one right now or do you see the two flip the other one there you go swap presenter mode now we got it we got it all right my friends uh yeah good evening and uh Wonderful to have. I hope there's a whole bunch of people online. I can't even tell right now, uh, but happy to have a conversation with you about uh, the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. Uh, for us, uh, this is what we want to try and cover tonight and, you know, in the next 45 minutes, uh, hour, uh, but definitely want to leave time for Q&A as well. Uh, so I am going to introduce you to our school uh, and then past that, uh, I want to kind of walk you through the national admissions process. Uh, I'm lucky enough to serve on the AMCAST advisory committee so that there's 12 of us deans across the country that help with the national application. Uh, and yes, uh, if you do look in the future calendar, I think April 21st, I have two other members of our, our AMCAST advisory committee uh, joining you for a session here uh, as well. So mark your calendars for that one. It'd be a great opportunity to pick our brain about the national app. But I'm going to try and I'm sharing that with you because I want to kind of share with you also uh, the national picture. I'll walk you through our specific school picture, but I'm going to keep trying to circle back to the national kind of thought and, and things that you need to consider as you apply across the country. Now, we'd love to see your application here, love to get you an acceptance here. But what we want to do more than anything is just help you be prepared to apply for medical school across the country and to get that acceptance so you could realize that dream that you want. So we'll look at the national, we'll look at the specific, and then I'm going to take some time to, to walk you through a couple of things you can start this evening uh, on your application journey and things you can be thinking about to get you prepared. Uh, and yes, uh, trust is a key, uh, both for us having this conversation, but you yourself, uh, the journey that you're walking, whether it's community college, whether it's undergrad, wherever you are on that journey, uh, it is your journey. And, and that's the journey that we want to hear about. Uh, I want you to throw away that imposter syndrome. 
uh, trust that the place in the way you are walking uh, is the right way to medicine. And that's what we want to learn uh, when we read an application is exactly who you are. Uh, so really want to put that in the forefront of our conversation and kind of reinforce it uh, all the way through the night. And, and can I just add one thing? Yes, you sir. want people to be prepared because you get plenty of applications every year. And so on a Friday afternoon, Friday night for you, you really want to do this and you have enough applications. So we thank you that you're able to join us. And, yeah. and You're too kind. And and Veronica or anybody, any team members uh, with me tonight, if there's something in the chat or anything you need me to just like jump in to just jump in there. Uh, happy to happy to have a conversation going that way too. So with this, uh, yeah, I'm taking you to a mental picture uh, of our University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. So if you guys are from Arizona or if you know Arizona, uh, the University of Arizona is 100 miles south of us uh, in um, Tucson. And, you know, thank you, 100 miles north of us is Northern Arizona University. Uh, here in town is Arizona State. Uh, but for us, uh, the University of Arizona started a medical school down in Tucson 75 years ago, uh, 15 years ago. Yeah, well, 17 now really for us. Uh, there was, you know, 2005, there was no medical school here in the, in the city. Uh, and so the Arizona Board of Regents asked us to the University of Arizona uh, to come up here and, and put a medical school. What we've done is we built a separately accredited medical school. So uh, if you were applying, you would actually apply to the University of Arizona College of Medicine Tucson or the University of Arizona College of Medicine Phoenix or both because uh, you could get your application out there more, which is fantastic. So we certainly share ideas and, and, and you know, we're, we're, we've got the sisterhood happening. I was talking to my counterpart today, you know, about, you know, application fees, you know, kind of stuff. We're always on the same page. Uh, but with that, uh, two different schools uh, for us. If you're looking at this screen, can does my mouse work, Aunt Veronica? Can you see that mouse moving around? Yes, I can Excellent. see it. Excellent. So yeah, where I'm circling right here uh, is the Phoenix Biomedical Campus. Uh, so we are, you know, I am right now on the tenth floor, looking north, right in that corner. Uh, this is our research building. This is our education building. Uh, all the way through here. We also have an old um, uh, Phoenix Union High School that we've taken over these buildings as well, our IT. We share basic medical science strategy or scientists with Arizona State University right here. But this is the Phoenix Biomedical Campus. It was supposed to be uh, the home of the Arizona Cardinals, uh, but the city council couldn't come together and uh, figure out how to do that. And so we decided to be the core uh, element of this Phoenix Biomedical Campus. And now we're a larger economic engine than uh, the Arizona Cardinals, which is absolutely fantastic. Other pictures, you can see just a different view of that, the historical buildings that we have, our, our partnership building with ASU, uh, and then over here, all of our education buildings here. And then just another view from the north looking south. Uh, you can see where the Diamondbacks are, Right over there is where the Suns play. So we are right next to downtown Phoenix, which is absolutely fantastic. So a great place for you to come uh, and be a part. And like I said, we're the fifth largest city in this country. 15 years ago, there wasn't a medical school. Now there's us. Uh, now Creighton has a satellite campus here. Mayo has a satellite campus here. And we have two DO schools, uh, which is absolutely fantastic because there's still a physician shortage across this country. So where a few years ago, there wasn't a medical school. Now there's five. Uh, and there's still a need uh, with that. So uh, we're excited for you to get an idea of who we are. So what I said, I want to walk you through the, the admissions process from the national uh, perspective right now. So if you are applying this next upcoming year, uh, and if I had to raise a hand, I'd love to see it. But uh, if you think of this next year, these cycles are very consistent. Uh, you would fill out that AMCAS, that national application in the AAMC, American Association of Medical Colleges. Uh, and with that, yeah, they're asking basic information, uh, demographic information, a personal statement, which I'm gonna take some time and chat about that this evening, getting your transcripts, getting your letters of recommendation, uh, successful completion of that, uh, you apply to medical school, I'll even tell you how many you have to apply to, uh, then hopefully you get this request for a supplemental application. We'll take some time talking about that as well. And then if all is going well, you get invited to campus for an interview. I'll talk about those interview processes, uh, but that's a quick way of what we're trying to do. What is it? 50,000 applications, 20,000 seats across the country. And so you do go through a very competitive process. 
getting accepted, uh, yeah, you do have to put your your net safety net out there uh, far and wide. Uh, on average, you guys apply to about you know 18 medical schools. I'm not surprised if I hear somebody say 20, 25 medical schools. Uh, I get mad at them if they talk about six medical schools because you've got to put your reach. You know, some people want to try and stay close to home, but uh, you just need to go there and, and cast that net out far uh, and then see where it is. Uh, I guarantee you, though, uh, you should be able to find, you know, 20, 25 schools, you know, what is 156 out there uh, that fit you. You're going to do your homework on that. You're going to go to websites. Every website has a story. Uh, you can go to the AAMC, uh, the MSAR, Medical School Admissions Record. They, every, every one of us have a commercial, uh, pretty much a really just a bio on every one of our medical schools. So you can kind of do your homework on where you want to apply. If you're from, you know, I'm assuming I got a lot from Arizona, a lot from California uh, tonight on this call. You know, you you like to stay in your home state if you can, or if you're from California, a lot of people applying to Arizona. Arizona, a lot applying into California because uh, it's close to home uh, and you have those connection points. So those are things that we'll, we'll kind of chat about. Uh, so as we go through this, uh, you know, and you're going through the application, we don't want you to go through it alone. We want you to make sure that you are using multiple resources and sources to help just like tonight uh, you're actually doing that kind of work working with your friends working with uh, you know people ahead of you that have gone into medical school uh, your your academic advisors uh, people that you're getting shadowing experiences from all those kind of people you want to get them to be a part of your team so it is team application as you go through this but as i say team application you'll hear me later on tonight about again trusting yourself because when it's all said and done, you're getting feedback from everybody, you know, about your personal statement. Um, at the end of the day, I always tell you to read it and make sure it's still your voice. Because uh, again, that's who we want to hear. I always tell you to go out and continue to get experiences. Uh, we'll actually talk about specific experiences that are valuable for you guys. Uh, but, you know, this process is very competitive. I already told you some of those numbers. I'll go through our numbers. Uh, but I always tell people as they're applying, you know, if you don't get in, a third of my class last year were reapplicants. Our mission committee loves the reapplicant. It shows that drive, that determination, that grit uh, that somebody has to have out there. So you don't want to apply to medical school and then just stop doing everything you're doing. Um, you know, just in case that wasn't your year, you're showing that drive, that determination, and that grit by still getting those volunteer experience, still going out in those good local sites, still trying to to show that you want to be a part of this this medical community. And then uh, this last one right here. Being able to explain your interest in medicine, that's the first one I could probably leave you with uh, right now. If your mom, dad, grandmother, uh, faculty advisor, uh, somebody you're shadowing with, ask you why you're interested in medicine, could you do that 30 second you know, pitch to them on why you are interested in medicine? Uh, what is that calling? What was that spark? Uh, start to think about that tonight because it will be a part of your application for sure but be able to articulate it, you know, stand in front of a mirror and be able to recite it, uh, look confident in it, have those passion points uh, of why you want to. If you can't answer that question, you know, that's where we got to start. You got to have to stand that part to get going. And then as you go through this, you know, people are always asking about uh, who else is out there. And like I said, I'm already telling you, uh, don't want you to think about anybody yourself, but uh, here's some stats that are going with you know, across nationally. Uh, overall GPAs, uh, overall science GPAs, MCAT averages, you know, medical schools, average class size is 160. We're only 120 here. I'll, I'll review that in a minute. Uh, with that, you know, different kind of communities. You could go to, you know, Colorado that has 200 some, absolutely fantastic, got three houses. Uh, you can look at us, you know, small class size about 120. Uh, but again, trying to find that right fit for you. If you are looking at this next year, and this is very consistent for us uh, as you go through this process, um, you're thinking about applying, you want to look early May uh, is when the AMCAS opens up and allows you to start putting information in it. Uh, they do not uh, start uh, opening for submissions at the end of May. That's the first time they'll start processing everything. And then for us, the medical schools, we don't get it till the end of June. Uh, and then and then there's a lot of work in between. Uh, we're going through a lot of interviews, a lot of reading, a lot of making decisions, who we're going to bring into campus, who we're going to invite to, to offer a C2. Uh, and then it's really April 30th, that next year, uh, is when you're starting to put that decision that this is where I want to attend. Hopefully that you have multiple acceptances 
uh, and you can make that kind of informed decision out there. So the cycle is they're very consistent across the year, and we you know, all of our medical schools follow this kind of pattern. Uh, so it is just really working, you know, learning how to navigate the individual schools you apply to and their specific kind of deadlines or requirements as they go through. So now I'm going to take a minute and kind of walk you through our admissions process. Just so you could see, I mean, you know, absolutely. I hope you guys are interested in our medical school, but but to see how a certain school just looks at it. We're, we're probably consistent across the country again, but there is some little tweaks to every school and there's certainly things for us. Now, when I, when I tell you guys to start going out and doing your homework, you're gonna try and find 20 medical schools you're gonna apply to. Uh, every one of those, as I said, on their website has a story. Uh, so right here, and everybody go read their their mission statements, but you start looking for keywords. Uh, so for us, we're talking about finding physicians, scientists, and leaders. So there's a couple of hints already for you. You know that we might be valuing leadership. Uh, we might value you know there's a core. You know I think everybody should be core toward the physician, uh, but also to the scientist. So the research. Uh, so there might be little hints right here. You know to who we are. And then you go to our core pillars and then look what I just have, education, research, clinical community. I mean, so there's things that we're highlighting right there and then we're reinforcing. So you want to start making notes on these schools and trying to see, you know, one, you want to see if it's a fit for you. Uh, but two, you know, if you get to that secondary application where we're going to ask more specific questions about you, you know, right there, you need to tie them into that school. Uh, so if I have in pretty much, you know, every school across the country, secondary uh, applications, they're going to ask a question about diversity. And so for us, you know, we talk about uh, inclusive excellence. So when you answer our question about diversity, use inclusive excellence. It just a little hint to me that you did your homework on us. And then if you're applying to, I don't know, uh, UC Irvine, and they talk about equity and inclusion, Talk about equity and inclusion with those guys. Again, just using their kind of keywords. And it just shows, again, that you've done this homework on them. So admissions data for us. So you could get an idea. We talked about nationally uh, what's going on. Uh, as Joe saying, we have, you know, we have plenty of applications. You know, we get about 6,000 a year. Uh, I think Tucson gets about 7,500, even bigger, because uh, they're, they're tied right to the flagship. Uh, absolutely crazy how many applications they come through but we want to work with them. And it's fantastic to have this. I've done MBA admissions in the past. I've done law school admissions in the past. And we are recruiting and we are, you know, recruiting like crazy MBA, begging people in law to go to law school. Uh, and so you're really not, you know, having that flexibility you need here, which really could shape a class and help, you know, inform a community, which is absolutely fantastic. When you do go through and look at those schools where you're applying, try and also decide and learn uh, what type of interview process they do. For us, we do the multiple mini interview, MMIs. Uh, what's nice about that, go to our website. We have examples of it. We have practice out there. Uh, we show you exactly what it's like for us to go through our interview process. Uh, if you come into the interview, we show you every room that you're going to be in. So you're just not even, you know, that that fear factor is kind of taken away. Uh, but do, do your homework on those interviews, you know, whether it's a uh, in-person, whether it's a virtual, uh, whether it's uh, with an alumni, whether it's with a panel, uh, and then prepare for those. Uh, our MMIs, we actually are one of the five medical schools across the country that are still doing on-campus interviewing. We love doing that because it gives us the ability uh, to uh, get to know you in a more personal uh, space. But also, you know, thank you. I'm putting my recruitment hat on. I'm bringing you to an absolutely beautiful campus and having you meet. You know, thank you. Um, on an interview day, we have a reception the night before. It's with students. You have breakfast the next morning. It's with students. You have lunch with students. When you have a tour with students, you know you can kind of see the theme I have with my applicant visit day. But I do everything I can to put you with students so you just get to know who we are at that that core level, and it really does help you get a better feel. And then you know if you are uh, doing a virtual interview, practice those. You know, get in front of what I'm doing right now and talking to a camera. You know, come up with some mock questions and then talk for three minutes straight to camera or have somebody else and do some Zoom meetings with you so you practice. So you just get as much and as comfortable as possible. And as you can see, all I'm doing here is just trying to throw out hints to you guys uh, as you go through this process. Now getting accepted, um, I'm gonna share with you a little bit on what I mean uh, later on in this evening about balance at all. But uh, in a short snippet, I used to sit right next to my learning specialist 
And they said the students that are most successful in medical school are the ones that are most successful in undergraduate. Now for you guys, uh, I gotta I gotta figure uh, you're already ones that are doing it because you're with me on a Friday night where you're doing much better things and learning about a medical school. But you got that drive, you got that determination. You are trying you're trying to figure out how to balance it all uh, right now. But you want that kind of idea. And again, I'll loop back to it. Uh, and then again on that story, um, we don't even hide it. I list the 16 attributes that we want from a candidate right on the website. And again. Every school, you go to UCLA, they're going to tell a story. Case Western, they're going to tell a story. University of Mexico, they're going to tell a story. Uh, and that's where you want to find. And so then, you know, hint, hint, you know, when you get ready to interview there, go look what we're looking for. And then try and highlight those kind of things. You know, leadership. I brought that up earlier. You know, this is something I've been, you know, you know, it won't be a surprise if you don't see a leadership question on there. Uh, so again, there's just the stories there. You just need to kind of unfold it. And I also put the 480 interviewed. Uh, this is a very typical for a medical school. Uh, so if I was in a classroom with you right now, I'd say, hey, how many how many do I have in my class? Uh, and you guys say, oh, you know, 120. And then I'd say, OK, what we do is we interview about four times our class size. And that's very typical across the country. So if you're trying to figure out where to apply, uh, you can kind of have an idea of how many to interview. And so we bring in about 500 people uh, to bring out to build out our class of 120. And then for us, we have grown. We were a class of 80 to 100 to 120. I think we had two years now of 120 uh, here. And that's what this campus was built for. Uh, my dean has actually walked to me and said, hey, can we squeeze a few more people in? Uh, we have to ask a lot more people than just admissions. But uh, we know there's that service need out there still. So if we could get that class up higher again, we would love to uh, because there is just that need across the country. Uh, but right now, you know, it's competitive uh, for us. But we also, you know, find fantastic candidates across the country. Academic requirements too. Um, yeah, we've done really well over here. Uh, I don't want this to be a scare factor, but I've been here almost seven years. Uh, when I got here, we were a 504 average in an MCAT. Uh, and then we went to 509, then a 12, a 13, a 14, a 15. We're in the 90th percentile now. But we also matriculated last year someone from a 501 to a 526. So you can figure out how to make an average. Uh, but our dean challenged us to find really strong academic students. Uh, and uh, with that, you know, it, it, we are a young male school. So it helps us recruit new chairs, new faculty. Uh, we want to see the competitive people uh, sitting right next to us. I will let you know, though, you know, yesterday, uh, we, we had an admissions committee meeting and we accepted 13 students. I'm going to call them on Monday and uh, share the great news. So I can't give you any names. Uh, but I had two candidates uh, that were selected by the admissions committee. And one person took the MCAT five times. Uh, we always say one or two is fine. After that, it gets a little dangerous. Five times. Uh, and I think their first score was a 492 and they got it up to a 511. And we wanted that person in this medical school. Uh, another person. Uh, 495, and they got it up to a 505. We wanted that person in this medical school. So it isn't all about a number. Um, you know, we don't play the U.S. rankings and all that kind of good stuff. But the dean, like I said, he challenged me to go to find good classes that are going to help this community. Uh, but there is room for everybody. And that idea, and I know that MCAT scares a heck of a lot of people. Uh, but no, uh, you know, that first time you got that exposure, you might not get that score you want. But, you know, we've seen people jump this thing up 10, 15 points when they find the time where they can dedicate themselves to be able to study. Uh, that is the biggest thing that just really boils down to. You need the resources. You need the tools. AMC has them. Your schools have them. Go seek them out. Uh, find somebody else. Find study partners. Find somebody you can, you know, that's been ahead of you and, and help you with those kind of you know tricks to the to this kind of whole thing. Uh, our learning specialists, uh, when we're getting ready, our students to go through step one. Uh, a lot of them uh, go through the Kaplan uh, QBank, uh, the flashcards. Uh, our learning specialists are huge on the flashcard kind of system. So, you know, but you got to find out what's the best for you. But just, I don't want this 515 to be a, a, a number out there too much. I want to, I want to talk about the stories of those those kids that taken it multiple times, that jumped it up significant. So, you've already taken it once, you're getting a little discouraged. You know, don't. Uh, again, if this is your dream, I want you to keep dreaming. 
Core course requirements to share in this real quickly with you. Don't think you need to dive into here too much, uh, but every medical school has this listed. Make sure you're meeting uh, those core course requirements. The one unique one, and not many schools have this one, but we actually ask for a physiology class. Uh, we know it helps uh, in the second block of ours, molecular basis of life and disease. Uh, we we added this after a couple of years here as a medical school. So whether you, you, know, you need it, you do need it here, but if you don't need another school, it's really a good course to have uh, for you to prepare for medical school. Some have a couple other tweaks to theirs, but again, as you go through your core course requirements uh, or go through the courses you want to select, or excuse me, schools you want to select, make sure you go through their core course requirements. And then a couple other things, just, uh, you know, you want them uh, grades two or higher, uh, upper divisions, labs aren't required here. Um, all of these, all these schools have these little specifics. So just make sure you're meeting those needs. Uh, every year I admit students and they don't have physiology and they're taking one like at UCLA Extension or at a community college, you know, right before they start. We don't need that stress. If I'm catching you guys this early, go find that course, uh, whether it's applied here or elsewhere, uh, it significantly helps. Veronica, doing a temperature check. We doing okay time-wise? Um, halfway through the slide, you're good? Yeah, we're, we're good. All right, you just keep letting, let me know. So as we go, uh, I want to talk about this holistic review process. I promise you, if you haven't heard it uh, yet, you're going to hear it multiple times. Uh, I think every medical school goes through this process where we look at your academics, we look at your experiences, and we look at your attributes. And so that's what I'm going to spend uh, time with. Now, I'm going to take you in these next couple of slides way behind the curtain, uh, which I don't think any other medical, I'm way too honest out here. Uh, but this is exactly what we do when we go through a process uh, to review your application. So first thing that happens, uh, Sam, <laughs> on my team, uh, end of June, you know, those apps open, we're going to make sure you're a U.S. citizen and permanent resident and you meet our minimum GPA uh, and MCAT. For us, it's a 500 and a 3.0. Uh, if you don't have a 3.0, you could do some post back or um, graduate work, you know, and so, you know, I think it's 18 credits of, of 3 or 0.0 or higher, and we keep moving you forward. But with that, you automatically get a secondary from us. You go to the next step, and then I got my team really busy. Uh, so that's where we're sifting through those, you know, and when I say 6,000 apps, you know, it's probably... 5,000 that'll complete the secondary. So it's already that number goes down a little bit as you know, you guys find out where your secondaries are coming from and then you make decisions on where you want to apply. I promise you, if you get a secondary, I'd fill out the app. I mean, just, you gotta keep those resources, but people make some decisions like that. But my team then, make sure you meet all those minimum requirements and make sure you got those core course requirements uh, and then demonstrate experiences. And I'll, I'll loop to those of what they are, but again, that's the start, the start of us making sure you have those well-rounded experiences for us. And then we have a lot of faculty uh, reading at this, this invite to interview stage. So I might have that 4,500 apps and I need to get it down to the 500 apps that we're gonna invite to, uh, to interview. So 4,500 minus 500, you do the math. Uh, yeah, there's 4,000 people already we gotta say no to, which is just horrible. Uh, but uh, we need to go through this process. So now we're starting to look and seeing if you guys have done your homework on us, talked about us, see if you have a fit for our mission or what we are. And so this is really significantly important for you. We're looking at the academic preparation. And again, that's, you know, it ties back to the academics as you get more and more competitive against each other. And then the commitment to medicine, it's just, you know, that really probably goes through the, that personal statement that I was talking about other areas in your experiences that we just see you're well-rounded all the way. And I'm gonna show those specific well-rounded and again, but you already see a one, two, three layers of review that we've already gone through now for you. And then uh, you're invited to interview. Uh, for us, we do the MMI, uh, that multi-minimum interview. Uh, what we love about the MMI is you have 10 interviews with us. So you have 10 different people that get to know you, 10 different scores coming in, but 10 opportunities to shine. And what I love about it too is, you know, maybe that first station, you are nervous as all get out, you know, and you might not get that score that you kind of want. And then maybe the sixth station, you're like, ah, oh, I just didn't really connect with that person. And just didn't feel like I had that good a conversation. 
And then you get to the eight station and you're like, you're reading the question, like, what the heck are they asking? I have no idea. Um, but guess what? You got 10 scores and then we average those scores. And then we know that there could be a higher or a lower. And then admissions committee could throw out one of those scores because they could say, you know, the person noted that they're nervous, but we could get a really good feel for you. Yeah. And so I think it's critical as we go through that. And I love the MMI process for us. And then admissions committee, uh, 22 strong. I got a chair. I got 15 faculty members, I got three community members, and I have three MS4, three you know, last year students. Uh, what I love about our admissions committee more than anything, if we get down to a really tough decision, uh, the admissions committee will turn to that student and say, hey, do you wanna sit next to this person? And our student is the one that's making that final decision. I think it just, it's fabulous uh, how we go through. Dr. But when it's all said Dr. and done. Oh yeah, Dr. Joe. Can you tell them, what the community, because that's a new thing that's been happening. Can you tell them what the community member is? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so faculty, pretty easy to say. Community is just anybody that wants to be involved with our in, in our medical education. So I've had a physics teacher there before. I've had a pastor. I've had a mom of a medical student at another college there. Uh, I have the director for the Arizona Medical Association uh, on the community on the on the call right or on the committee right now. So it is a wide range of people, but it's just somebody that is committed to us. Uh, people that have been donors before you know, to a school, uh, people that aren't faculty working at one of the hospitals. It, it's everything, but it's just it is somebody that wants to. And I love it because you know the faculty. You know you could think about a surgeon. You know and what they're thinking of when they're looking at a, a file. Uh, and then think of a family medicine person, uh, but then think what a pastor might read and bring in that to that, or someone that is working for the Arizona Medical Association brings to that conversation. And then what a student brings to that conversation. It just brings a, a wealth of, of knowledge to us. Uh, and we love that variety of experiences. So, you know, community members to me always brings a, just a little tweak of a conversation, a little thought here or there, and it just aligns us so well. So yeah, Jovan, thank you for that. And yes, uh, that little number that flew, flew up here, uh, what I absolutely love about our, our process, before we make a decision, 35 people would have touched your application. Uh, to me, that's truly a community coming together uh, to build a class. Uh, and you know, I told you I did other I, MBA admissions. I was the final say, making decisions. Law school, I was the final say, making decisions. Here, I'm not the final say. I got a committee. Uh, I'll tell you, I, you know, we have 15 meetings. I get a half hour before every one of them. And I talk to them, I chew on the ear when I want done. <laughs> Thank you. But <laughs> when it's all said and done, uh, it's the community making the decision. And I love that. A little more into us uh, and what you see in a medical school. Uh, it's the fun stuff. Uh, your first two years of medical school, pretty similar. Um, we have a dual block directors uh, you go through. We, it's Oregon-based system, but we have an MD and a PhD in every one of them. So we have kind of the theory and the practice uh, in every one of our courses. Oregon-based, there's different ways medical schools look at it, but we just have you kind of working your way through the body. Uh, we have a fantastic doctoring program. So you know, what you're seeing these pictures of here, you practicing being a doctor, uh, I'll be, I'll be, I'll, I'll toot our horn a little bit, uh, you know, when our residents are out there working with our, you know, our kids and when they're in their third year uh, going through medical school, they talk about how well prepared, uh, Dr. Moffitt runs our, 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 uh, doctoring program. And, uh, she hates it when I say it, but I'm like, oh, you scare the living out of these students, but they're prepared. She's like, oh no, I don't. She goes, yes, I do. Uh, but she gets you guys ready, which is absolutely fantastic. We do at the end of every blocks. Uh, have these capstones and community clinical experiences. So a capstone reinforces what you just learned in the classroom and uh, community clinical experiences. For two years, you are out there with a the preceptor, which is a physician uh, out in the community, and you're, get, you're getting to do what you love. We, we got you in the classroom, but we're also putting you out there, getting experiences with uh, patients, with doctors, and just learning how the systems work. So you get to practice being a doctor all the time. We do this PAL block as we call it, but it is allowing you to customize your curriculum. Uh, so there is times where we just have you again, this kind of dedicated stuff to what you need, whether it's gonna be, a, I know right here, scholarly project. We are one of the few medical schools that ask for this, but you need to be a lifelong learner. And now that step one is went to pass fail, we're seeing more and more students out there uh, that are requiring you, um, 
you know, to try and set yourself apart because you don't have a score anymore with step one. And so the scholarly project, a publishable paper or a poster or this research project you do, uh, it's a fantastic tool for you have when you go to interviews for residency, you can start talking about this scholarly project. It's something unique that not all these other medical schools aren't doing. So, and as you're a physician, you know, you got to go back into the books for the rest of your life uh, to continue and learn. So we're teaching you how to do that, uh, that learning all the way through. And let me do a click. There you go. Third and fourth years. Uh, yeah, our our first two years is actually not two years. It's 16 and a half months. Uh, we actually try and get you into the clinical training earlier, your MS3 year. Uh, that's where you're rotating and learning how to be a doctor and you're going and doing OBGYN, psychiatry, surgery, emergency medicine, all those kind of fun blocks. Uh, but we do it early so you can start identifying what type of physician you want to be. So when it is time for that ARIS app to open up, your residency application to open up, uh, then you're you're ready as well. And you can start doing those subspecialties and those elective courses in those kind of competitive areas. So again, when it's time for residency application, you're ahead of the game. We do longitudinal patient care. We do have a clerkship up in uh, Flagstaff, well, three places in rural Arizona where you actually do six clerkships together so you can see patient life cycles, which students absolutely love. And again, you're still working on your scholarly project. <coughs> and then we do have some other unique tools for you. Uh, you can come in here. You don't have to identify before you get here, but you could talk about certificates of distinction. So there's areas you could focus on. Again, something else you could chat about uh, in your residency application. Taking a drink, sorry. And then we do have dual and concurrent degrees. Uh, we do have an MPH of public health, uh, where it is a concurrent degree. You get it done during the four years here. So you can do two degrees if you want. MD, PhD, thank you, it's seven years, uh, but there is people interested in that, so a dual degree. And then we're just rolling out an MD, MBA. Uh, as you saw on the very first screen, I'm the director of that program as well. And we're just finalizing the details with uh, Eller College of Management. And so you could earn an, an MD and an MBA uh, during the same uh, four-year cycle. Something unique to us when you saw those pictures uh, of our medical school, the one thing you didn't see was a hospital next to us. Uh, Tucson had a hospital right next to them. So we decided to do this distributed model. And so we partner with nine different clinical partners. So you're going out there in those clerkships and those community experiences to all these variety of hospitals and if you think about it, you know, Banner University, that's our that's our main teaching hospital right next to us, you know, a very general, largest uh, system, you know, here in the state of Arizona, mile and a half from us, uh, three miles from us, uh, Phoenix Children's Hospital, two miles from us, uh, the VA, two miles from us, Valley Wise, the county hospital. Uh, what you're seeing here, though, is if you think about those ones I just named, you're going to see different patient populations uh, if you come to this medical school. If you go to one one where it's tied right next to a hospital, and this is, thank you, I'm selling a little bit here, should stop that. Uh, but for us, uh, what we love is you're able to see all these different kinds of patient populations, which we think is invaluable for you. So again, as you're doing homework, it's certainly something you could consider out there. So, okay, I'll take off my recruitment hat for a second, but it is a cool system. And then, uh, yeah, I wanted to share this with you. We do have California and uh, Arizona here. Uh, but in your head, real quick, uh, where do you think we get most of our applications? ASU, U of A. I always set you guys up for this. Someone's seen this presentation before. Uh, yeah, look at that. Uh, I get 800 applications from Arizona. I get 2,000 from California. So way to go, Isha. You got, you're, you're in good, you're good hands over there. Uh, so with us, uh, which is fantastic. Um, we do all we can to really learn about uh, the kids from California. You know, when we get to that uh, match day and in, in residency, we keep about 40% of our kids here in state, 60% uh, go out of state. You know, truthfully, as a state university, we want to flip that. We want to get 60% of them here in state, 40% out of state. But we also have to get the residency programs built out. That's something that we have to do as a young medical school. But yeah, UCLA, USC, UC Berkeley, or, uh, uh, UC San Diego, UC Berkeley represents well. ASU, they are right in our backyard. So we do end up more uh, of them. But uh, as we offer the interviews, uh, again, you know, our idea to serve the state, uh, ASU and U of A kids get invited the most. But there's, you know, the UC system still strong. BYU, they're coming down from Utah. Uh, when we make the acceptances, same thing. Uh, you see uh, Arizona and California strongly represented. 
And then when we matriculate, same kind of thing just shows up. Even NAU showed up, which is fantastic. We ended up with 17, 19, 20 states every year. You know, so it's not, you know, these are just the big numbers. Uh, so we do get a cross section and we are getting more and more East Coast, uh, which is fantastic. Um, but it is nice. I mean, our, our job is to really support here. And I think we're doing a good job there. Okay. So now I'm going to get into the part where I want you guys to start getting ready for medical school. And a couple areas that you could concentrate on. Uh, and like I said, you know, right now you can start building your personal statement. I won't read all of these. You read while I talk. Uh, but there is some key ideas that you need to think about this. I talked about earlier about that, that why medicine. Uh, and that's where I want to kind of take you through this. Um, what I love more than anything about a personal statement uh, is personal connection. And uh, I could give you a couple of, I'll, I'll give you one example, which just was amazing to me. Um, so thank you. You know, a few years ago, you know, I'm at that age, I lost my parents. Uh, both of them went to hospice. Uh, absolutely fantastic. I got to hold their hand at that last moment. Uh, meaningful to me for sure. And anybody that works with hospice, oh my gosh, we love you. I mean, that is a tough call uh, to be out there, uh, but it is so rewarding. But I'm reading this personal statement and, uh, you know, thank you. You know, I probably read, you know, don't, don't go give away too much, but probably a thousand apps, you know, in a season. And uh, I always start with the personal statement. And with that, uh, this one kid wrote uh, a story about he working at hospice and this family uh, went out to lunch and all of a sudden he noticed it was this person's last moment. And all he did was, and I got to keep it together. He sat down and just held their hand. And from that second on, I was such a fan of this kid. I'm like, he's got to get an interview here. We got, you know, it just, I just had this personal connection with him. And it was just this, this great story. Uh, and it just meant something. And, and yes, he did get invited. I don't remember whether he got in, but I do remember he got invited uh, to interview. Uh, but our admissions committee uh, talked about a, a personal statement yesterday. And they're like, and, he, and this one faculty member that was presenting the, the student, he's like, this is the best personal statement I met all year. You know, and he, that's what he started with. That's what he started to try and tell all the rest of the committee why we wanted to vote on this person and, and admit him. And he was, uh, and it was a military background and it was his service, uh, you know, some military uh, assignment he had, uh, but you know, in a medic kind of uh, field. And it was just so drawing, but just the personal connection of why he went into the army and wanted to be an army, you know, uh, medic. And, you know, you just, you just became a fan. So what I'd love for you to do when you're thinking about this is think about that human connection and you don't know when it'll happen. You know where it is. You could be doing it, working in a clinic. You could be waiting for a physician to walk in and you're just having this conversation with a the person. They're nervous and you help them or they got bad news and you're walking out to your car and you see that person and you walked up to them again, you know, and just, you know, it, it just reinforces why you want to be in medicine. I think that is the most powerful personal statement. So you might already be thinking about it now, like, I, my gosh, I got one. And if you don't, don't worry about it. Um, it will happen as you go through and get all these kind of experiences. So do's and don'ts with the personal statement. Yeah. Present tense, resolve stories, you know, remember, you know, you got, you want to be approachable. Uh, you want to make sure, you know, you're not rewriting your experiences. We don't want to see that. Have it fresh. Uh, you don't go through a whole life story. It is one or two things that you're trying to reinforce. And for me, again, it is, it is why medicine and just why that spark, but having a human connection tied into that why medicine, you know, that reinforces what you're saying. I guarantee you it's powerful, my friends. And when I say that last one right there about uh, sharing, get excited about this. I mean, you know, start working with friends. Start thinking about this story tonight. Ask some people. Uh, like I said, your family, friends, they're going to they're tell you you're great. You know that. Uh, but they might also make sure, you know, you're not too boastful. You know, um, I always talk about servant leadership. And that's, you know, hint, hint, servant leadership. If you're thinking about my school, write it down. Uh, but it is someone that has this personal humility but this professional will, they won't be stopped, but they're just the most you know, you know, humble person out there. Uh, they never use an eye in the world. They just, you know, that, that kind of person. Uh, that's what you want to make sure you're, 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 you're humble all the way through this, this application process. 
Uh, and then yes, start reaching out to other people. You know, there's probably resources right here with this group that you're working with, uh, your advisors, the people you're, that you uh, you trust. Uh, see what their initial reaction is and see what they're what they're thinking. Uh, trust the current medical student, hunt them down, tackle them, make them read it. You know, there's people out there. Every school's got one. Somebody's got a, got into medicine. Go find them. Uh, and then, like I said, I reinforced this earlier. Uh, when it's all said and done, the day before you hit submit on that application. Uh, make sure that you read it and it's in your voice. I want to make sure that you trust yourself. And then uh, one last one I want you to think about. You know, this is me on that AMCAS advisory committee. Uh, AMCAS now has 19. Uh, it was 18 the, when I wrote, wrote this uh, last year. It's 19. Uh, I'm excited because I was one of the 16s across the country that petitioned and got the AAM to see to add that last one. Uh, we just added advocacy and social justice. Uh, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And so you can note uh, now those kind of advocacy and social justice ideas you have. But when you go through uh, your application, you have 15 experiences uh, to list. And with those 15 experiences, here's what I really want you to kind of concentrate on. And if you write down five things, write down those five bolded areas. Uh, as you go through, or take a picture on your phone real quick. Uh, as you go through these areas, when I talked about that holistic review process, think back in your head. Uh, we talked about academics and you know what we needed out of there. Uh, you talk, I talked about those attributes, all those things, all those roadmaps that we have out there for you uh, to be able to figure out what a medical school is looking for you in their specific school. And then I talked about experiences. I mentioned the learning specialist and they talked about us, the kids that are in undergrad uh, that, are, that are most successful are the ones that are able to balance it all. And for our school, and I think across the country, uh, these five areas are what you want to do to show a really well-balanced application and well-prepared candidate for medical school. Now, that very last one, I'll start, uh, extracurricular hobbies, only need one. So uh, with that, we just want to know you're really stressed. You, you, you like to skateboard, you like to knit, you like to bake, you like to hike, you like to whatever. Just list something that shows, I hey, I'm I'm a human. You know, I'm not just this machine trying to get into medicine. I you know I have this other side to me. That leaves you 14 things that you could list. You know whether it's clinical, whether it's research, whether it's leadership, and whether it's community or volunteering. And these are the things I told you earlier. If you're applying to medical school, don't stop. Keep getting these experiences. But if you put a application together and you get that experiences section and People ask how many hours, and, and I can't answer. Um, everybody's got a different story again. How much access, how many opportunities, how many years, you know, all that kind of good stuff. But to be a well-rounded candidate to find a medical school, it's fabulous uh, to have these. Okay, I'm about to click off. Take your last picture. Here we go. And the last one I'm going to slide, uh, send with you uh, is our match day. Uh, this is me putting my recruitment hat on one more time. I won't click the video here, but go look us up on, on YouTube. Oh, my gosh. We celebrate like there's no other medical school out there. There's a reveal every year. Uh, we have flash mobs coming in. We do this countdown. There's confetti every time. Uh, and, yes, this young medical school, you could see where we're putting kids. I mean, unbelievable places, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, if you come from another state and you want to get back home, we'll help you get back home. Now, if you come here, we're also going to spend four years trying to recruit you to stay here, uh, and that's fine. But yeah, look at some of these places we put. I mean, just across the country, this this medical school has done a fantastic job. I've been an honor and a privilege, and I'm very humble to be able to to be this service uh, leader for these last few years in admissions. I just took over student services as well, so. Uh, registrar, financial aid, credentialing, student government, student life, uh, which is really fun and rewarding. So now I get you guys for the entire life cycle, uh, which is fabulous. Uh, and yes, when you do apply, uh, I want you to get in here more than anything, uh, but also across the country. Uh, love for you to be able to, to get out there and, and get that acceptance and realize that goal that you have. So I'll get off the stage. Uh, we'll open up some, some Q&A. I don't know how we're doing on time. Veronica, are you still happy with me? Still happy. And some uh, questions have been coming in. So we can start with the first one. Should and I get off this share screen? Should I get so we uh, yes, please. There you go, my friend. He knows what he's doing here. I got that. Escape. Escape. Perfect. All right. Let me see. 
One second, I had it up here, but it changed. Okay, okay. There, here's the first question for your medical school. What kind of resources are available for um, first-year medical students, such as mentoring, tutoring, etc.? Yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah, you walk in here. Uh, I actually teach the very first course with, you know, thank you, an MD, uh, and because I got the PhD side, and it's called Introduction to Medicine. We take you through everything you're going to see for the next four years, which is a great, it's like a two-week orientation, uh, but you are introduced uh, to your learning specialist. So every single person's assigned to a learning specialist, and they meet with you so you can learn how you best learn. And if you have struggles or you need help anywhere through those four years, they're there for you to be that kind of resource. We also have these uh, big sibs, little sibs. Uh, you get one faculty and eight students, but you have somebody from each one of the classes uh, and we get you guys together. It's really part of our wellness program, huge dedication to wellness as well. Uh, we have psychologists uh, on campus, on site, on our team uh, to help students that just need help and have conversations all the way through. But these wellness teams, uh, the only requirement is you can't talk about school. Uh, it's all the other stuff that goes on. Uh, we do have career advisors as well. They're going to, we really tell you not to worry about it too much early on. Uh, but, you know, we're needing, as you guys are getting more and more competitive, earlier and earlier identification to help you through. Faculty, we're a small school still. I mean, approachable, open class. I mean, just, we, we are just one of those schools that are just there. And that scholarly project, we have a team that's uh, helping you find a project, find a mentor, uh, help you if you need um, uh, to try and do extra research, uh, IRB approvals. We're, we're just there for you. So very resourceful school for sure. All right. And our question was, I'm 45. I have two kids. I work full time and I'm now deciding I want to be a doctor. I know in order to be competitive, you have to have leadership leadership roles and research experience. What do you recommend for someone in my position with limited time in order to be competitive for medical school? Yeah, yeah. the non-traditional, we absolutely love you. I got a 36-year-old that just went to last year. I, haven't, I don't think I had somebody in the 40s uh, recently, but every year uh, we have someone that has kids, family, balancing, juggling it all. Uh, you look at our last match uh, video and a six-year-old daughter's up there and saying, hey, my mom just matched at Mayo, you know, kind of thing. So that is very, very traditional for us. Uh, there is different journeys for everybody. And that access and opportunity uh, is defined different ways for you. So, you know, yeah, I might be a rural student and it's really hard for me to get those clinical hours because I'm just not near anything. Uh, I might be under resourced and in, in, in a living in a community that just can't get out there or I'm raising my family like you're talking about right there. I just can't get those opportunities. Uh, just tell your story. Um, you know, again, I love to have that kind of well roundness that you did. I talked about just a couple slides ago. Still, you know, on a Saturday morning. Thank you. You know, hopefully there's a, a partner helping you. You know, and you could go out there and do some community help or you could get over there and get a clinic or you could try and do some research. And even if it's online. Uh, but get out there and just, you know, tell your story. And, uh, you know, yes, I think they're going to be home. We'd be excited to have you be a part of the class. Like I said, this this medic, uh, I think he's going to be in his 30s that, that's coming in right now. Uh, that's uh, fabulous. We've had lawyers. We've had pharmacists. I mean, we have everybody, a naturopath uh, doctor. Uh, we love the variety to the class for sure. Although with the lawyer, you guys all have to be careful so you don't get to it, right? There you go. Uh, we have another question. Uh, it says, I'm an out-of-state student attending school at Arizona State University. Uh, they were wondering if going to school um, here or having ties to Arizona will increase a chance of admission to University of um, Arizona Phoenix. Um, so yes, uh, ASU, you can come to the dark side. So the Sun Devils and, and Wildcats, that does happen. Uh, as you saw, uh, we matriculate the most. Yes, we love your application. You would know us. There's a reason to be able to easily identify why you want to stay here. Uh, something I didn't, I'm glad you asked that question too. Uh, as you're thinking about uh, you know, applying to medical schools, if you guys have any ability to get to any of these medical schools you're interested in, if it's attending an information session, if you're going to, you know, you're from Arizona, you're going to California and you're going to Newport, thank you. And it's right next to UC Irvine, you know, and spending two hours on the UC, UC Irvine campus. You see somebody walking with a short white coat, tackle them, say hi to them. 
And guess what? When you apply to UC Irvine, you get to apply in a present tense. Uh, I've been on your campus. I've talked to your students. Again, it's a fabulous way for us to get to know you. So if you're here in the area, you know, you're from California, you're at ASU, get over here, find a way, join our information session, you know, go talk to our students. We're all over the place here. Uh, and then guess what? You know, you get to apply in a present tense. The one thing I would warn though, and someone did it, you know, just recently, uh, you know, they said, hey, I got to talk to Dr. Fogarty. They tried to drop, you know, drop a name a little bit too much. Uh, and the missions committee was like, eh, you know, that doesn't feel right. But, you know, again, a humble way to say it uh, is, is fabulous. And yes, we get a lot of out-of-state ASU kids still applying here because this is home, you know, now for them. Okay, Veronica, it's your turn. Yeah, our next question that came up is, does your school have a live cadaver lab for anatomical dissections? So I could insert a joke about there's not a live cadaver, but oh, but yes, uh, we do have we we do have a a clinical anatomy, uh, and yes, we do have uh, a wonderful donor system there. And students have a course; it's their third course in uh, spending time in there. And then there is other opportunities for them to get involved uh, in. Uh, uh, in this area. And it is, I guarantee, and that's why you're asking, which I love the question, it is, feels like the rite of passage to medical school. Uh, of all the things we do, I think when you get into clinical anatomy and you really start to decide and, 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 and serve and, and learn uh, in that environment, that's that's where you feel like a medical student. So yeah, and, and, and we put great honor, like I said, on our cadavers. Uh, we put it up on our sixth floor uh, with a fabulous view, uh, just as, again, just a representation of it is the most important thing that we have in our school. Uh, I think it was great, great work there done. Another question is, do you have any application advising available that is low in cost or free? Advising, I mean, for uh, any of them, I mean, for us, we just had a information session today and I just talked to Mark, my director. Uh, we had nine people signed up, zero showed. You know, what a wonderful opportunity to go to the information session and have an hour with my director of missions on, like I said, one on one advising. I mean, that would have, if anybody showed up, that's what they would have got, which is fabulous. So sign up for a session, show up for those. It's a great opportunity. You'll see. Some of the same slides, uh, truthfully, uh, but you also get time uh, with us. We do mock MMI interviews. Uh, if you're local, we have different kind of opportunities to kind of to learn uh, how to apply day, uh, usually in the spring. Uh, so we do have just, you know, check our website. And most of the schools have opportunities. You know, we have fabulous pipeline programs as well. Uh, high school programming, college programming. Uh, we call it Saturday Scrubs, Summer Scrubs. You know, for high school, we have a pre-med academy for ASU kids or anybody here in the state uh, for undergraduate that want to kind of learn how to apply and get experience in the community. We have that. So look up the pre-med academy. So wonderful tools all the way across the board for us and other schools, too. Yeah, the only thing is I would add is there's a few system program that the WMC <laughs> has, um, but also, um, you know, not a lot of people get Dr. Fogarty for an hour and a half and basically telling you what it is. And in, I think, two months, they're going to talk to you about how the application is, how they see the application, and how to fill it out. So to me, you could hire someone who doesn't, you know, doesn't do this. Um, uh, Dr. Fogarty and his colleagues, I think each of them uh, see 5,000 applications. So <laughs> you're going to get uh, you're not going to get any better. Um, and if somebody tells you that you should pay to get a better result, I to me, um, that's, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to get good results. And so you have a lot of free resources. We post a lot of things. Uh, I know that the Me Mentor has a application academy. So there's a group of medical students that you apply to this program. And during the whole year that you're applying, they'll work with you. And so there's a lot of programs out there, so you don't have to pay for it. And if anybody tells you that you have to pay for it, that you'll get a better result, they're just taking your money. So yeah, there's great resources out there, just like what we're doing right now tonight. This is just fabulous that you guys have this kind of community. Um, we have another question. It's isn't there uh, much more than 500 people who fit the mission are academically prepared and have a commitment to medicine? 
how do you possibly narrow down 4,000 to 500? And what is making those 500 stand out? Yeah, thank you. That is the, that is the dilemma across the country. I guarantee you, we miss fabulous candidates every time, but we have no choice. Um, it is how we make the choice is everything I just spent the last hour talking about. It is it is trying to find that that match to the mission, to find that connection point. You know, if I am brutally honest, you know how I read an application is going to be different than how Mark, my director, reads an application. How the faculty I recruit, you know, if it's a surgeon reading, if it's a family medicine person reading, it just it is different ways. If it's a community person, I've had ex admissions committee people reading, you know, on that invite to interview stage, uh, and we just have to make tough decisions. Um, you know, thank you academically. Um, you saw my MCAT average. Uh, so, you know, for us to be competitive, yes, it's better to have one closer to that average. Like I said, doesn't mean I just didn't admit a 505 and a 509 and 507 yesterday, uh, but there isn't, there isn't as many. I mean, that's just the reality of who we are. Uh, Creighton, they're in town. I think they're a 507 or 9 average. I think Tucson's about the same. You know, we're definitely higher uh, over here. And then you got the crazy, you know, uh, Mayo at 520 average. So uh, uh, if you get that kind of score, you're going to get free offers all the way across the board. So yay, you guys. Uh, but it's 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 frustrating. And I get disappointed people, you know, writing, reaching out to us all the time. Uh, but it is us just trying to do our best to see if you guys are matching the mission, uh, if you got the well-rounded experiences, if you're competitive, active, I mean, just it's all of it coming together. And I know, uh, and my biggest heartache is when we're down to that last couple of people to invite to interview and Sam will come to me and say, hey, I need one more. And, you know, and then I'm looking at, you know, 18 people right there. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got, you know, I always know who my last one I invite. You know, and I know the one that I probably would have been next. You know, just, it's killer. Uh, but it is, it is the process we have to follow. Yes, Dr. Fogarty has, has equal amount of heartburn as applicants do, right? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So this next question is from an, an out-of-state um, okay. person, and they're asking, how are the summer months like in Arizona? I'm used <laughs> to the heat, but Arizona seems like different territory. Oh, I love it. Uh, personal statement uh, last year, I won't use her name, but I know who exactly what she is. She's like, I, I want to apply to, to Phoenix because of this, 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 but I've only been to your state once. I went to Sedona and I thought I was in Mars. <laughs> and we just laughed so hard, uh, but she had reasons. Uh, she was learning. She was from the Midwest. She was learning Spanish. She wanted to be on, be on a border state. I mean, she told a fantastic story, you know, and then I, you know, then I got Emma for, oops, I just used her name. Uh, Emma from Maine, uh, and uh, she applied to our medical school, never been to our state. Uh, we still made the admission because we loved who she was. I am driving from Arizona to Wisconsin, where my wife lives, and we're going to see her parents. Uh, we're in the middle of nowhere, Colorado. She calls me. She's supposed to be leaving the next day for Arizona. She's freaking out, and I'm outside a courtyard talking to her for 20 minutes just to say, hey, you're going to be okay, and She's got here and, you know, thank you. Now she's one of our leadership positions in our medical school. So uh, you don't have to have a connection here. Uh, like I said, I like it uh, if you do, but we still find you. Uh, if you got the story to tell and you have a place and you have a mission uh, of who you are and where you want to be, uh, you know, we do our best uh, to find you. Uh, but yes, uh, and if you can, like I said, if you're interested in schools, you know, get to them uh, and know, you know, know the, pa the patterns too. Um, you know, I could do a quick little rundown, you know, like I said, Tucson, us, uh, Creighton, absolutely apply. Uh, M, you know, uh, Mayo, you got to be a 512 or higher MCAT to even apply. So it's crazy. Uh, you get over to California, do your homework. You know, uh, you're not applying to Stanford or UC San Fran without a really strong MCAT. And I really identified in high research, uh, UC Irvine. Uh, you see San Diego, fabulous schools, uh, great missions, you know, apply away. Uh, UCLA, competitive. I mean, they're all, all three are competitive. All UC systems are competitive. Uh, UC Riverside, you better tell you're interested in primary care and want to live in the Inland, Inland Empire. They probably want to look at your app. I mean, that's who they are. That's their mission. Uh, Kaiser, new medical school, apply. Cal North State, apply. Uh, Cal University, apply. I mean, there there's new schools out there. You get up to Oregon, uh, 
they got a big focus on in-state. So you got to know and you got to be really competitive. You get to University of Washington, they do the WICHE program or Western Alliance, the WICHE program. And uh, and so they got to reserve seats for Alaska, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. Uh, and so there's not many out-of-state seats. Washington State, newer school, apply. Uh, Nevada, Nevada UNLV and Nevada Reno, apply. Uh, they're always looking for students. Utah, a little careful, mostly in-state. Uh, they reserve 15 seats for uh, if you went to high school or college there, but that's their BYU pipeline. That's exactly what that is. Uh, so not many seats. Uh, New Mexico, I mentioned those guys. 90% uh, have to be from in-state and the other 10%, if they're not in-state, they get in trouble. So that makes it tough. Uh, Colorado, apply. You know, 237 students or something like that out there. Uh, and then a lot of people from Arizona, a lot of people from California end up applying to the Big Ten schools because there's big size classes uh, into the Chicago has a lot of schools out there, or you start looking out east. If you look at Texas, you know, it's a, another application system. But if you get in a big focus on Texas residents, but if you get in, then you get Texas residency, which is fantastic at most of the schools. So, and so you could get, you know, medical school at a really good cost. So, again, you got to be strategic you know, as you go through there and making your decisions. Sorry, that was a sidebar like a no tomorrow, but I brought it. All right. And our question is, how do you balance your academic work and personal life? How I do it? Well, how I do it, no, I'm just joking. Uh, how you guys do it, uh, yes, we want to make sure there's a balance. If you really dove down into our curriculum, we're building wellness weeks into everything and wellness days and ways for you to be able to have time to go grocery shop and go to the doctor and go to the dentist and all those kind of things. We're putting a, a huge emphasis uh, on wellness. And I think across the country uh, that is happening uh, as well. You will work with that learning specialist. You are going to learn, you know, how you best learn. Um, I'm always disappointed. I'm an, I'm an old, thank you. Uh, I like you guys coming to class. So many of the kids now uh, don't come to the lectures uh, and, you know, they listen to Panopto at 1.5 speed and then kind of hear what's going on. So we're getting smart on you guys. We're flipping the classrooms. We barely have lectures anymore. And so we're bringing you guys for on-campus activities. So you reinforce how you learn. So you're doing little modules beforehand. Then you come to campus for interaction, kind of learning. That's how you best learn, truthfully. Uh, and then, you know, we still have a time. I think it's 37 hours of curriculum a week. Uh, and so there's a ton of study time. It's done to prep. You know, you are busy. Uh, but guess what? You know, the vast majority, you know, of our students are graduating. Uh, and so we are going to make sure you're successful. Yes, there is one or two a year that have to step out. I mean, that is just the reality of it and a different path, different goal. Uh, but for the mass majority of them, we get you guys through. So if you get in here, we're going to get you, we're, we're going to get you across that finish line. Uh, this question is regarding volunteering and community service. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, they weren't able to volunteer much till recently. So do you think that that would impact how the experience is seen in the eyes of an admissions committee? Yeah, um, I think you're going to start seeing the, the COVID question kind of go away. We've had it. We didn't have it this year. Uh, and it was it was kind of centered on, hey, how did COVID affect you? Um, but we know it's reality. And, and I hear my missions committee all the time saying, hey, you know, maybe a little bit lighter on the clinical work and hey, we didn't really see it, you know, in 2021, but duh, you know, it, you know they, they couldn't get out there. Uh, and so we set the bar that, you know, and we don't have quotas on, you need 600 hours here, 400 hours, there's nothing like that. Uh, but they could see, you know, that dip possibly in some, in some activity in their freshman, sophomore year, and all of a sudden their junior, senior year, they were finishing online. And so those experiences kind of went away. Uh, don't be afraid of a gap year. 88% uh, of my class had a gap year. So they finished college and then they went and got more experiences uh, out there. Uh, if you do that, uh, we don't mind also you earning a living during that time. Uh, we don't want to just the privileged kid that just can you know live at mom and dad's and, and go get all those experience, make the most competitive. Uh, we understand if you're a scribe and you need to work 3,000 hours on that scribe because it's paying you 15 bucks an hour, you know, to be able to afford to pay off school and get experiences and go do community work and try and do everything else to be a competitive candidate. Uh, so if you had the COVID, you know, and most apps too uh, have uh, like our last question on our secondary is, is there anything else you want to tell us about your application that you just don't have noted elsewhere? Uh, be careful with those, you know, 
no excuses, uh, own, you know, uh, wherever it is, you know, and, you know, you know, during COVID, I wasn't able to get those kind of clinical experiences. I was able to get on one phone bank and try and help here and here, which I think was valuable. Uh, but it also, during that time, gave me the ideas of this, I got to be this, I got to be a physician because this type of service, it just drove me crazy that I couldn't get out, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. So uh, we do know it, we do recognize it. Um, but uh, yes, you know, taking the time, getting those experiences still uh, important. Yeah. And I just put a link on there. We did a two hour talk about uh, all the stuff that you could do uh, about how to deal with COVID. There are things that you could do with like 12 hours of training and you get paid. Um, you know, only a few people that could work for free. There's a lot of things you could do short term that you could get paid 20 bucks an hour. Um, there's also jobs that you could just get with a CPR inside of a hospital. Um, watch that, watch that. It's about two hours. Also, um, there's ways that you could go shadow. You know, they, they, we show you how you could go shadowing and steps that you need to take. So the information's out there and that comes down to people will have access, you know, well, you know, the information's out there. People will take them and use them and they will have them and, you know, and like what Dr. Fogarty said, don't make excuses because the information's out there and there are people that are doing it. So. Great advice. Veronica, what do you got for me? You got a good one? I got a good one. Um, when, when during the application process is the personal statement reviewed? Uh, everybody's different. Um, I, you know, like I said, my read, I go first. That's the very first thing I go into a personal statement. I want to get you to know you at that level. Uh, should I be really honest, Veronica? Shake your head. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So I'm reading a thousand apps. I go through the first few sentences and I'm seeing if you're capturing me. So just, you know, it, it and doesn't mean I go through the rest of the app, but do I read every single person, every word? Ugh. It's hard to, uh, when you got so much that you have to go through and all the other duties and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so, but I like it cause I want, I want to be captured and I want this, I want to like this person as I go through the rest. Uh, I know Mark goes through stats first. Uh, I know one of my, my chair, uh, he goes through experiences first. So everybody reads an app differently. Uh, for me, scroll down, personal statement, click, read. I want to be a fan and just, and then, like I said, I'll go to all those other areas, but I want to be a fan starting off. That was too honest, wasn't it? That was too honest. Okay. Around save me here. All right. So working as an ICU nurse, I have the opportunity to participate in some unit uh, unit audits. If I make a research project out of it, will it be counted as research in the application process? Since it is not school related, or would I need to have a podium presentation for it to count? No, totally counts. Uh, this is the active research and you do it. There's dry labs, there's wet labs, there is active projects. You are counting stats. I mean, there is so many ways to identify clinical work, uh, research. Uh, that's fabulous that you have that kind of title already. Uh, we're already interested in you having that kind of background uh, and you trying to shape your application in the things that are meaningful to you. Uh, you are building a great app right there. That's, that's impressive. And the only thing that I would ask as a nurse, um, uh, people that do clinical research, physicians and stuff, they will like give their kidney to have you on their team because there's things that you could do as a nurse that a regular clinical coordinator can't do. A pre-med student can't do. Um, you could also do uh, so much in clinical research that like you have like six feet leg on any undergraduate who doesn't have a nursing degree, you could do things in clinical research that if you approach, I mean, there are clinical research nurses that make really good money. I mean, ICU nurses make good money too, but you could have, approach anybody that does clinical research. Say, I'm a nurse and I want to do research. And um, they will like, you know, they, they will like send their driver to pick you up. <laughs> I'm liking tonight, guys, because you are you getting some real honest assessment. I guarantee you. I don't I haven't seen this too often. This is great. Uh, we have another question. Is the MD PhD application the same as the MD? Uh, that is you had, for our medical school, you identify as you apply whether you're going to do the MD or the MD PhD. So 
with that, you should be multiply published already to be competitive where I have 120 seats. Uh, I have 119 seats because I have one for an MD PhD student each year. We're trying to get it up to two. Uh, we do share our community with Tucson, so we have a bigger MD PhD community. But you go through the first two years of medical school together, uh, and you're just a you know you are a MD student, and your scholarly project is really on that PhD work that you're going to do. Then you take off for three years, and you finish your PhD. And then you come back and do your third and fourth year. So it's a seven-year program. Uh, what's fabulous about it, you're fully funded. So medical school is free. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and it's um, we do amazing work with those kids. They are just so dedicated to what they want to be. Uh, and we do want them at a bench, but we also, you know, we want to find kids that also want to still want to be serving and, you know, still have a, a clinical round and, and have that well balanced all the way through their career. Um, the next question is, is it okay to be vulnerable and personal when you're doing your personal statement? 100% please. Uh, will you? Um, I've had a struggle. I've been scared. I didn't know this is me. This is the point where I saw that I can't be stopped. Um, I have it. I had an eating disorder uh, that I need to overcome. I've had, I mean, we've seen everything. We, again, uh, it's great that we just had an admissions committee meeting yesterday, uh, but someone, you know, talked about uh, living with a life with stomach ulcers. And, you know, the biggest thing I had was applying to medical school and the, you know, and just, I mean, just everybody's had these different kind of stories again. And, and we, we don't mind the authentic. Uh, I think that is, if you had a struggle and, uh, you know, even with mental health, uh, we've made admit decisions for it. So uh, being your real you, uh, it helps us get to know you. And that's where you stand out. Don't try and not be somebody else, you know, or try and build out a picture that's not you. Uh, we, I think, you see through that really easily too. Uh, but if that authentic person's there and there's a story to be told, tell it. We're we're there for you. Hello, Veronica's dog, who's now go. Oh, you're giving it away. You're giving it away. It's all good. All right. And our question is, would working as a clinical research coordinator count as research experience? Clinical research coordinator? Count as yes. research. It depends on the work you're doing, but yes. I mean, if you're doing something inside a lab, like I said, wet, dry, in any kind of area, if you're doing any kind of experience that's showing that you're collecting data, writing up data, publishing data, postering data, uh, helping on a project, uh, absolutely, it counts. Uh, this question is, I'm in my third year for my undergrad, but I have no experience except for the classes I've taken. If I get close to graduating and have no experience, should I wait to apply to medical school until I have experience, maybe after graduation work and volunteer for a year and then apply? Yes. Yeah. You, you To be a competitive candidate, you need to be well-rounded. You, you do need... We need to know that you've been in a clinical environment. You know what a hospital is like. We need to know that you, you know, shouted a few different people and and understand a couple of areas of, of medicine uh we'd love for you to you know scribe where you're seeing you know what a patient's like and and what a day-to-day -day operation is we want you to have some kind of research i mean we do admit a few people that are a little on the light side on the, on the research you know because we're going to give to them here uh but they understand what research is because you got to be a lifelong researcher you should be able to be getting le leadership experience right now club organization something if not start one uh, start some science club right now uh, be the president of it and guess what you're earning hours uh right there uh volunteering you should you should be able to get that while i'm in undergrad as well and there is something to do about breadth and depth uh so i love uh you know breath seeing a whole bunch of different kind of experiences but i also value depth um i had one uh one nice thing we do at this medical school is i call every one of our accepted students same thing i'm trying to build a relationship with you guys the reason i bring you on campus interview why i talk to you uh i'm also when i make that acceptance call i find out where else you are in so i can start recruiting against you know not against but uh you know recruit uh a little bit on what i'm trying to get done with you guys uh but uh i had this one student and i couldn't get a hold of her and usually you know i tell them hey look for a phone number you know from my work uh, on this day you know, it's either going to be someone selling you a car registration extension or whatever the heck those home warranties are or something like that, or it's you're getting into medical school. 
and uh, couldn't get this 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 girl for like three days and I started to send an email and like the third day I finally got a call back uh, and she's like I am so sorry I'm in the middle of Bolivia right now I'm back at this clinic that I've just been helping for the last six years I just had to get here one more time you know before I go to medical school because these kids are the most important you know and I'm just like oh my god I love you you know just it was fabulous that she had this kind of experience. And you don't, everybody doesn't have to have an international experience. People ask about that too. No, uh, find what's important to you. But if it is important to you, go back to it and go back to it and go back to it. And so we see that depth, you know, that you're just going to this one free clinic, the COVID clinic, you know, wherever it is. Uh, I have one here, uh, a food shelter that just my wife and I love. And we just really, you know, the people there, the ones that run it, it's a young girl that runs it. I mean, she's fabulous. And so, we jump through a wall for that. She calls, we're there. You know, just it's fun to have those kind of experiences. The next question: um, Do you guys know of any other organizations that help with the application for med school? They they state they only help students who live in California. Joven, you want to jump in there? I think you know better than me. Um, yeah, I mean, we post a bunch of stuff out there. There is this thing called uh, the National Association, NAHP, where basically your school, I mean, I don't know where you go to school, but your school should have that. But if your school doesn't, there is uh, this website that I put the link, you could contact them and you could actually search and find an advisor that's closer, close to you that could help you. And some of these folks that are volunteering, like I know the uh, one of the medical school folks uh, volunteers with this organization because she's actually speaking in a couple of weeks uh, or next week, the fourth. Um, but uh, this association, um, she volunteers with this association and a lot of people do to make it accessible and equitable. So you could reach out to them and they could help you. But we try to post as much stuff as we can. Yes, we're in California. I'm in California, but we've got people from all over the place. And if you follow us on social media, we post things all the time in our stories. Um, so uh, just being aware and, you know, you know, don't throw your hands in the air. There's a lot of resources out there and it's free. So just, you know, put your ears to the, what is it? Ears to the ground? No. Yeah, I always get those all messed up, but yeah. yeah. Um, follow us on social media. We also send out a bunch of links and stuff. Um, that you can do there's like programs that we send out so uh, we post a lot of stuff so just being seeing them out there um but i don't like have a specific i don't know where you're specifically so i don't know where i could you know um but also send us a question we may be able to offer some stuff but look at the nahp if your school i know if you're going to a community college or small school you may not have a pre-help advisor so you could find this organization and 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 find a lot of support out there. And definitely the double AMC. <clears throat> Look at their resource guide. They have a ton of information out there too. All right. This is a question about the Pathway Scholars. Oh, so would you say that the Pathway Scholar application is essentially the same as everything you stated today? And if there's anything else to focus on specifically, if we plan on applying to both programs. Yeah, so to everybody out there, the Pathway Scholars Program is a one-year master's program. Uh, with successful completion of that, you get a direct admit into our medical school. We have 12 seats reserved for that. Uh, I'm starting an early assurance program with ASU right now. It's another kind of pipeline program for us. It is usually reserved. You know, My goal is maybe 20 out of the 120 seats uh, are reserved for these kind of different various, you know, uh, underrepresented kids, uh, rural, you know, uh, we know the, the, the science is out there, the research is out there that shows, you know, a, a patient wants to see somebody from their same race, their same background, their same language. Uh, and so we try and have these programs that are built out. Uh, Pathways is for Arizona residents only. Uh, it is two separate apps. You got the national app. So if you're applying to medical school, <laughs> we also have the Pathway Scholars much more detailed, a lot more into your into your history and your, into your background and your call to medicine. So it's two different apps. Uh, we only have one applicant visit a day. 33 kids come in for that one, about 300 apps a year, 33 uh, invited, and we have the 12 seats. Uh, but it is a fabulous program. Uh, again, it is just truly someone that has that call 
uh, to medicine, hasn't had the opportunities to to get those kind of experiences. So, you know, where I have a 515 MCAT, uh, and when that absorbs the the pathway scholars, you know, we had a last year a 501 average uh, for the pathway scholars. So definitely a difference uh, out there. But we give them a year of master's work uh, to get ready. And then they end up being leaders in our class. The last three years, I've had a pathway scholar on my admissions committee. The vice president of the student body right now is a pathway scholar. I mean, so they are fabulous students. The only, only mistake they make is they never know how to say no. They keep doing everything. Uh, and I'm like, got to worry about medical school too. But uh, they're a great program. So yes, do your homework on that for sure. Um, the next question is asking advice on how to get into the MD MBA program and they don't have any business background. So would that be a problem getting into the MBA program? Yeah. So Isha, what's the rest? All I see is New York is a Yankees or what else you got on that thing? It's just a pioneer club thing. Oh, okay. Okay. Just checking. Um, so yes, uh, I'm director of the MD MBA. What's fantastic for that uh, is you just apply to medical school. You start medical school then you decide whether you want to be in that MPH or the MBA. Uh, truth be told, uh, you don't need any experience in that uh, that MBA either. You're you're welcome to to look at that program. But where my MPH is an additional five to seven thousand on your tuition, not bad at all to get two degrees. Uh, the MBA, uh, thank you, Eller College of Management wants forty eight thousand five hundred, so about another fifty k uh, to add that. So you want to make sure that you are interested in leading a physician's group, want to be a CEO of a, of a hospital someday, that you have that kind of drive and determination to have that. Certainly would help in the residency application and as you're going in and trying to get into a, a hospital group, but you really want to make sure your focus is, is that's where you want to be because that is a, you know, medical school is already expensive and then to add 50K to the doggone thing. Uh, and it's and it's actually a fair price. There were 45 credits, you're only charging for 34. Uh, and we're sharing 11 that they're allowing us not to charge or get charged, the student charged. Uh, so it's really nice, but still a big lift. So if you if you do look at our program, just get in there and then learn about it, be successful in medical school, then we can have that conversation. Our next question is, when it comes to volunteering, what is the average amount of hours that your incoming students have had? Yeah, can't give it, don't have any. There, yeah, yeah, there, there's no... There's no quotas. There's no hours on any of these. I've got people with a couple thousand. I got people with 300. Um, you know, I, 160. I mean, I'll make up any number there is. It's it's out there. I would not. I would recommend you got 15 experiences. You get to list. Make sure you list 15 experiences. Uh, you have those uh, areas where I'm talking about uh, the clinical, the research, the leadership, the community, the extracurricular. Have those covered. Uh, make sure you're really showing a well-rounded person. Uh, but again. I'm a rural kid. I can't get and volunteer too much. I, I, I'm going to have less. I'm well, a double MD parent, you know, and get access to everything. I can have a couple thousand. It just, it's just your story. Yeah, I think a lot of pre-meds look for a concrete number, and there is none. I mean, you could, you know, you like you said that person's been going to Guatemala for six years. I mean, that's that to them was important. Yep. Um, but yeah, so some people do something six years and stop counting and some people count you know i work in the er and so we have people that come in and volunteer and they sit there and count 20 minutes here and 20 minutes there and we got to sign their forms i'm like i i, I mean i don't know if that's important to you then i'll sign it but you know yeah. um it's a friday night and you're like 7 30 at night and i'm sure that your um your partner would your spouse would be mad at us if we keep you any longer so thank you again for coming. Yeah. Oh, and no. it, my wife was very smart. She went and we, she went out with dinner with friends. She's like, yeah, forget <laughs> you. So <laughs> any any last words of wisdom? Oh, uh, no. I, I mean, it, it's all the way back to the authentic self. I just I, I want you more than anything to trust yourself. And that's the biggest thing I see with candidates. Even the day they're interviewing with us, they are so nervous. And Mark and I are telling jokes. We're trying to break ice. We're doing everything we can. Uh, and we just say, just trust yourself. When you're gonna knock on that door for ten times in an interview, just be you. And and, and like I say, I thought I love some of your questions you guys are asking. Uh, and you know how vulnerable, how open. You know, yes and yes, uh, vulnerable, open. Just 
tell your story and it is the right story. And if it, if you don't get in that first year, try, try again. Like I said, 33% of our class are reapplicants every year, a third of the class, you know, you know, and that don't be afraid of the gap year. I mean, it, it, you might need to concentrate and do that best you can to get those GPAs. And then you don't apply for three years. Fine. Um, take that time to get those experiences, study for that MCAT. Uh, and then when your time's there and my 45 year old out there, I mean, apply, we love you. Um, we want that kind of experience. So there's no right time for anybody. It's just your journey, your story, and we'd love to learn about it. All righty. Well, thank you very much. Um, 